You want to tell him what you're drinking, no? Well, he's drinking chai. Does this look like chai to you guys? Bash him in the comments! They do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to our stupid reactions to the of Corbin. I'm Rick. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter. It's juicy. Yeah. Corbin likes to uh, post pictures of me shirtless. Yeah. Sometimes I do. It's a Halloween cup. Or fall. I guess. More fall. This it, is... It says, hello, pumpkin. This is really good. It tastes like fall. It's a great fall drink, and it has an aftertaste like pumpkin pie. Mmm. It was a tall, iced... Chai latte. Does it taste like cultural appropriation? With, That's not chai, am I right, guy? With oat milk, brown sugar syrup, <laughs> some pumpkin cream, and cinnamon powder. It sounds fall, is what it sounds. It tastes fall. Mmm. Like your mom. How does that work? Well, I was gonna get really graphic. <laughs> Today, we're doing a little interview, and this is actually Money Rotnam. We've actually never done a Money Rotnam. No, we interview. haven't. Uh, we've seen, I think, quite a few. Five, five six, seven? I think because it's the three, then there's Del Se, then there's Guru, then there's. So, yeah, Thada Poppy, seven. right? That's him. Mm, that's so six or seven. Yeah, it's around there, so it's a decent amount. We have not seen any interviews of the man. No. Um, but we do appreciate his directing. Which, in case you didn't know, if we don't see an interview about someone, we just assume they don't exist. That's true. Yeah. Um, Except Ranveer. Yeah. We, we've seen everything. He's ever done. All of his body. Of work. <laughs> Anyways, this is... I don't know. I don't know what you're It's a Monty Rodham interview. Really. Great. Uh, this is a Monty Rodham interview. There you go. Uh, no. This is an excerpt from Peter Weber interviewing Monty Rodman at the British Film Institute in London. It's a very interesting and insightful interview. The brevity with which Money Sir responds is quite impressive. The scenes in the interview are edited due to the copy infringement rights. I understand. I think you guys would know Peter Weber, the English director who directed Girl with the Pearl Earring. Also, Money Sir is man of few words. To make him talk is a Herculean task in itself. Knowing how much you both enjoy filmmaking and the art of filmmaking, I hope you guys will enjoy. Absolutely. That's what they said about LJP, but we got that man to talk. That's true. And he was lovely. He sure was. He was awesome. We've been told that by a couple of people. We were told that Pankaj would be a bit shy. We were told mm -hmm. that Nawaz would be shy. Yeah. And no, they've been They're awesome. all wonderful ghosts. Yep. Uh, maybe Ramani Rodham. I heard that Ranveer's really, really shy, shy. So he needs to prove that by, yeah. by talking to us. I, I totally agree. I think agree if he with talked you. with us, he'd probably come out of his shell. And if he doesn't talk to us, then he's just, he's just really, really afraid to. And just everyone's going to know how shy he is. Here we go. <clears throat> Looks like a still frame. What led you to become a filmmaker? What led you? What, is, you know, what, what, what was the particular path? I know you came from a filmmaking family, but apparently they didn't even let you watch British. films when you were growing up. Yeah. Good call. Uh, actually, I was uh, a management consultant. And I was so disillusioned with my job <laughs> <laughs> that I decided to move into films <laughs> as a stopgap to see whether this is what I want to do. <laughs> Actually, that was the first step, and uh, I didn't think when I was growing that I would look at this as a career. It was a passion, it was something which I liked, yeah. which I enjoyed, which I understood a little more than the guy who was sitting next to me in the theater, mm -hmm. in the screen, and that's all it was. And, uh, but then you looked at it as an option is to see, you know, if you want to take a chance, you have to do it when you're 22, 23, I thought. It gets more difficult as we get older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's when I thought I'd see whether I have a flair for it okay. and uh, took some time off and tried to get into it. This, this might seem like a, an odd question because whenever people talk about cinema, they always talk about the art. But in a way, I suspect that there are some things from your background as a management consultant that have been quite useful in terms of, film, of filmmaking. Oh, it was absolutely wonderful, you know, in the sense when I did my first film and I got a break finally, it took me quite a while, Yeah. about two years or so, to struggle and convince people that to put money into a film and mm -hmm. to trust me to direct it. And I uh, went into the film all set to do a film with all the management techniques that I knew. And uh, four weeks down the line, I had thrown 
and torn apart every bit of <laughs> the script was intact but all the management schedule and the per charts were into all over the place because i think you understand that in cinema you know you kind of uh, reinvent what is written on paper <laughs> it is not a it is it is not a, a, a duplication it is not a conversion in the direct sense yeah. it is actually reinventing it yeah using a completely different language there's too many variables mm -hmm. so it is not so easily you know um, applicable you can't take technique and apply it. but i think the sense of what any education gives you is a sense of reasoning mm -hmm. and uh, a logical approach to things i think manimen does it quite a bit and uh, in a strange way it helps me a lot when i write scripts really Yeah, <laughs> that's how so. That's <laughs> an, I don't know. Because I, I, I'd imagine that you would, you would say how it might help you in terms of knowing how to deal with crew or with managing yeah. actors or something. How would, how does it help you writing scripts? Yeah, uh, I think it gives you the sense that you're constantly in the early stages when you start to write a script. You constantly step back and say, where am I going? Right. What is my goal? Where is my trying to reach? What is my story? Okay. And then you take the broader view all the time. Right. And then see whether I'm reaching that, and uh, you know, approach the problem as you no, know, not just one way, but look at it and see what are the other options, and you know, and look at it a little more logically and not just emotionally. Okay, that's very interesting. Look at options. Look at. and constantly step back right. to be you know disassociated with it come back and look at it clinically mm -hmm. even when you make the film you know after you've done the script and you make the film you get too involved that you see only pixels <laughs> you know but you don't yeah. see the picture yeah. so you sometimes have to come back and see whether you know what you originally started with you know that that is still there right. you know, whatever drove you sure. the, the core that drove you is it still retain or is it lost in all the details You said something interesting just now about um, the, the way that a script is a is a blueprint, but you have to kind of bring it to life if you yeah. like. Are you very precious about the material that you've written, or are you quite happy to rip it up and chase a completely different idea when you're when when you're actually there on the set? As we all know, time is money. The clock yeah. is ticking. Yeah. You've got to finish a certain number of scenes yeah. during the day. But the scene isn't quite working. How 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 how, how do you deal with yeah. that? <laughs> you're struggling to find to try to put the blame on somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> It's the biggest problem, you know. <coughs> when you you know in India when we play tennis, mm. you know we have ball boys there, you know, and invariably the only time you get angry at the ball boys is when you hit a bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it's in it's the same case, you know. So. It is tough. It is tough when you know a scene is written mm. in a room, in a table, you know, on a yeah. computer. Yeah. And you come there and you put people there and you have light. You have the camera. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the entire ambience is set and there people, the actors, yeah, who are there, who are delivering. And if it's not working, then you have to come up with something fast. And everybody is watching you. Yeah. And, you know, you have to pretend you know everything and still come up. That, that, that's the thing that I find. That I find the hardest is when when you realize it's going wrong, and everyone on the set realizes it's going wrong, and at that moment they all look at you, and, yeah, you, and, 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 and the clock is ticking, and you have to come up with some kind of solution. Yeah, and you yeah. if you're in the edit suite, yeah. then it's fine. Yeah. You say stop, you go and you get a yeah. cup of tea or a cup of chai or whatever. But when you're on the set, you can't. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't yeah, stop at all. Yeah. Let's let's have a look at our first clip. Um, they, these are mostly in in chronological order, so I wanted to. Take you back. It's a very short clip, 37 seconds. You have to forgive my pronunciation because I'm just a stupid English person. Um, so you can correct me if you want. This is a, a clip from your 1986 film Mona Raga. Mona Raga. Okay, yeah. There we go. Mona Raga. You can roll the first clip, please. As I told you, some of these clips, some of these clips end quite suddenly. <laughs> um, So how how do you feel when you watch? I I have a great problem watching anything that, that I've ever made because the moment I finish it, it's like onwards. Yeah. How do you feel? I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, nice. What what? It's pretty calm. Why is that? I mean, I think I understand why it is, but maybe you can tell these people why, why it is. <laughs> uh, when you watch a film, you can watch for this length. It's all right, but beyond that. All you see is only the mistakes. mistakes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and the other Everything thing that didn't work is that because you've sat in the customer room and you've seen it 100, 200, 300 yeah, times, 
the, any joy has just disappeared. Gone. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you're glad that it's out of your life and you don't yes. have anything yeah. to do with it. <laughs> and also, it becomes other people's property. Yeah. Yeah. Because we make it for other people, really. Yeah. The day. And, so, and the other people have a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they do indeed. Um, <laughs> one thing I think is that, that's interesting for me, coming from a different filmmaking tradition to to you, is that you not only have to deal with the elements of, let's say, um, social realism, um, actors, dialogue, and the rest of it, but but with this kind of song and dance thing. Yeah. Um, and so, which draws on a completely different skill set. It's not about psychology. Yeah. It's a, it's about display and it's about choreography and it's and in some ways quite mechanical, but full of the joy of life. How yeah. how on earth do you do that? Yeah. It's a great question. I, actually, I think uh, you know, once you accept it as a part of your film, yeah, then it's a very liberating uh, process. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it does something which. I think uh, it's very unique to an Indian film, yeah. and in in the flow of a film, this kind of kind of uh, lets you reach an arc of celebration mm -hmm. of uh, you know of whichever way, whether it is uh, whether it's joy or whether it is the moroseness of a sorrow mm -hmm. or whichever emotion you got to, this will let you travel that in a very abstract fashion. You're not born by logic. Right. You're not born by you know literary movement. It just gives you an abstraction yeah. which lets you fly and land back at a completely different point okay. and get across what is inside a person's mind in a different fashion. I think it's a very liberating thing. So, so it's like liberating the subtext in a way. Yeah, yeah. I think it is in the sense that it it comes out of actually of the oral tradition in India. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean uh, mm -hmm. in over the years, we've always had this tradition of telling stories, you know, uh, across, not written, but orally. And uh, all the epics have come through like that. Yeah. And they've all come through with, you know, with text and with music in between. Music too. Mm -hmm. Phrases yeah. with verses in between. And sitting on emotion. And yeah. when you grow up as a child, you listen to it with a man telling you this great epic of Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. And in between, he breaks into a song, right? And he tells you, and that gives you, you know, the pause to take in a situation, take in where you reached, and lands you into the next thing. So it's kind of, if it is used very well, I think it's a tremendous tool. And I'm, I'm really sad that you guys don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> so much. <laughs> That's there's, there's two things, two, two follow-up questions I want to to ask about that. Because if, uh, when I was uh, you know, doing some um, research for, for our conversation, um, this is a quote I came across. Um, sometimes quotes from the internet are completely wrong. So I'm just I'm going to put this quote to you yeah. and you can tell me whether you've had some truth in it or is it just bullshit? That's the technical term, bullshit. <laughs> um, I admire how Mani Ratnam delves into Hindu mythology and creates contemporary renderings of it so that Roja is actually the story of Savitri and Satyavan retold and that the relationship of the brothers in Dalapati is in fact drawn from the story of Karna and Arjuna. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay, come on, no. you can do better than just yeah. saying yes. <laughs> I'm not accepting any yes or no. <laughs> okay. Expand a little bit. Yeah. yeah, actually, you know, to pick something that you've grown up with, which has been written years and years and years back, yeah. and find it relevant today, mm -hmm. in today's world, in today's context, that it is happening in front of you, and it is still, the emotion is still the same. Yeah. Whatever was there, if it is, you know, just replanted into this situation, mm -hmm. you still get the same emotion, you know what I mean? So, so somewhere classics are made out of that. Yeah. You know, something that lives time, that gets through this. Mm -hmm. So it is true, it is true that Roja's base is really from, uh, I mean, from an old, you know, classical story of a, of a woman, of a wife, right. fighting with the god of death for her husband's life. You know, I mean, it is a fantastic story, but, you know, she won't let the, you know, the law, god of death take her husband away. And you know? when you work with this material, do you find the story and then it, reminds you of something from these epics or do you start with the epic and then try and find something contemporary? No, it works both ways. I think in terms of Roja, yeah, yeah. it was the other way. It is what is happening around us yeah. and the fact that it kind of resembled of something which I've known all along. Right. You know, it it touched the same chord. Yeah. You know, it's completely different. You're dealing with something else that is contemporary. Kind of like when you but the emotionally it was right. yeah. similar. very similar. So it was uh, 
Whereas when you take the other film, Thalapati, for example, mm -hmm. that is based out of uh, two characters out of Mahabharata. Yeah. And uh, that came from the Mahabharata. That started with the Mahabharata and okay. then it became a contemporary. It's a, I think it's, a, it's something that is very strong. I mean, obviously it's the case in um, Indian culture, but in Western culture it happens maybe a bit more than people realize. So, for example, Star Wars. Mm. I think one of the reasons it has been so successful um, with audiences it's uh, the work is very much based on Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is to do with analysing mythology and finding a way. So I actually think it's a, there's a, there's very few stories, yeah, you know, yeah. as you know, yeah. and and this is a way of reaching back into something that that has been around for a very long time and has a kind of strong yeah. cultural resonance. Let me ask you a more practical um, question about what, a, a sequence like this. How do you put it together? You have dancers, you have a choreographer. Yeah. How much is planning in advance? How much on the day? How much do you storyboard? Well, just some of the nuts and bolts. Oh, okay, I'll go the reverse. The storyboard is zero. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> zero. Just uh, we choreograph it right before. Yeah. You know, um, but when you say before, during rehearsals or on the yeah, day? Yeah, not on the day. No. So when the music has come, yeah. we are ready for the song. Mm -hmm. We get it uh, composed. Yeah. And uh, we get the actors to train yeah. for that song. Yeah. So we take a few days off in that, and that they get set. And then we go and shoot. Ah. And we have a deadline. And, <laughs> and these are regional films where we cannot afford to you know, stretch right. at all. Right. So we have to do it really fast. So a sequence like this would take, would, would be how long? This, this is a, maybe a four minute song. It would have taken us two and a half days. We have several. So yeah. you're really. Working, working, working very quickly. Yeah. Okay. And how long are you allowed? Because there's all kinds of union rules in the UK in terms of how long you can keep. I mean, how long can you work these guys for? How, how, long, how long is a shooting day? How long is a shooting day? How much can I, I say publicly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The regulations are slightly looser. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Not a union. So your day starts when the sun comes up and it stops when the sun comes down. Goes down. Yeah, mostly, but sometimes we stretch into the night and okay. you know, do night work. All right, <laughs> very good. Um, I think time for our next clip, um, and this is Nayaka. Nayaka. Okay, Nayaka. which okay. is a film from 1987. Okay. Second clip, please. I, may, I, I one of the things I love about this this scene is the restraint, the way that you're just you're looking at the faces of those actors. And you hold and you hold and you hold. We know what is there, but you only really reveal in a, a wonderful kind of operatic moment when you come. Oh, well, that's not the oh. end of the interview. I think they probably should have cut off when they did the clip. Yeah, <laughs> not, not, in, not in the middle of a question. <laughs> but really, really good interview. For, great interview. I mean, it says part one, so obviously there, there's more parts to this. But it was really good. I thought right. the interviewer was asking good questions. Some of the questions we've asked to. Uh, some of the directors and actors. We, yeah, we it's a 45 minute interview maybe and you don't want to do the whole thing in one shlebang so totally get that. But yeah, and it's funny that last part about the crew, um, <laughs> I think I've told the story before where I was talking on set uh, about when we we did the interview and got the behind the scenes stuff about Jolly Katsu and the lighting and I was talking to a couple of the other actors and the assistant director was standing with me while they were setting up the shot and we were talking about technical stuff and I mentioned the interview and mentioned how they shot with the the lamps in the and the first thing the, the assistant director said was yeah that's because they don't have a union yeah because <laughs> the fire laws they were breaking and the labor laws yeah. climbing in the trees and putting real fire in the trees and that's absolutely true it's absolutely um, true yeah it's a it's a blessing I guess and a curse for the for the, sure. for the workers because sure. you might be working 18 hours a day. Yes. And, if, and they want the money. Which is also why probably a lot of white actors are terrible because if you're getting a SAG actor that comes with rules. <laughs> they come with a union. And yeah. there's a reason there's a union. It's because this industry has notoriously abused yeah. their workers. In fact, as we say this, yeah, there's right. negotiations going on between um, crew that works in television and film yeah. and the, the producers and, in terms of this very thing. Hours work, yeah. wages pay. Yeah. So very common. But I, I really liked uh, having somebody, it's all the difference in the world because one of the things we get to do as SAG members um, is we're invited to come to see what are called SAG screeners. Mm -hmm. If a film is nominated for a SAG award, you get to go watch it. And typically the 
filmmakers are there, the actors, the directors, and there's questions that are asked. The qu person asking the question and their understanding and love for film makes all the difference in the world because I've seen people questioning and struggling and the actors are there just hoping they're gonna ask them a relevant question. Who was that when we saw the questioner? Was it Willem Dafoe or was it a different actor? Willem had a good questioner. Who the last it? time I remember a question that wasn't good, I don't know if it was, was it one we went to? Yeah, it was. Oh, it was. Who was it? Uh, it was, and we were, it was Willem Dafoe. Was it? And he was great regardless, and we yeah. pointed out how he just got past I thought the, it was the Willem person. Dafoe. Yeah, because the person asking the questions was just not yeah, he was, aware of what he was doing. No, absolutely no. not. He and he clearly, is a, he's a filmmaker, so yeah. he... Knows what he's talking about. That yeah. was, that was yeah. fun to watch. Really intriguing. Uh, really good answers. Stuff I like. I feel like w since we've been in this world for almost three years now, one we get a lot of the movie references for one, but we also know a lot of the answers. Right. Like since we've talked to a lot of these people, we know that there's not unions. We right. know how they kind of do song ones and kind of what he echoed about um, about the songs and what they mean yeah. and, and stuff. Cause we've grown to. Like, it's actually, you guys, I famously said at the beginning, I don't like songs and stuff. And I right. still sometimes don't. But if it's done the correct way that a lot of Indian films do it, right. then I've grown to appreciate that. Correct. Just as I was amazed by, while we were watching the Opu trilogy, mm -hmm. and I was reading a book about Satyajit Rai, and had a revelation about Eastern storytelling compared to Western storytelling, and how that has influenced Indian filmmaking. Yeah. Which is the specificity of, in Western storytelling which comes straight from the greeks all the way through the roman empire through shakespeare which is the western mindset for storytelling it's always been about having a story that has a through line and you have action that becomes a conflict and a climax and a resolution and you see an arc with your characters well indian storytelling doesn't need that mm -hmm. to be a good story then from our vantage point when we first started to look at the films we would critique it from that vantage point and say there was no character arc. Mm -hmm. There was no conflict, climax, and resolution. Mm -hmm. And it was the Opu trilogy that I appreciated. A lot of the times, we're just going to want to be in a place. And what the film is going to depict is not character or story driven. It's going to put you in a place and time and feel something for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And then also what he said about he hates watching his work. Very common. Very common. And it's, it, he's right. Not only do you hate watching yourself, I, I hate watching myself uh, in terms of acting or something I did. It's just because all you, literally all you see is the mistakes or what you could have done better. And so you can't look at it objectively. Yeah, I, I have mixed emotions about it. Yeah. I will watch what, my work because I want to see if it translated. Yeah. And I've, sometimes it's worked and other times it hasn't. Like, I remember when I watched Barbarian for the first time, I was really scared when I watched it. And I remember the first time I watched myself switching from Peter and Regulus and I went, it worked. Mm -hmm. That was great. But then I remember watching me do Fagin for the first time. And as much as I was in the moment and was in the character and I loved the vocal template, what the Fagin I saw in here, when I saw him here, I went, that's not Fagin. Yeah. That's me. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to watch it. Yeah. I don't like watching me be Fagin because yeah. it's not him. <laughs> yeah. Even directing, like, for the videos that we've even done for the channel, like when I did Header, I was so happy to just get it. Get no. it done. I was done with the editing process. I was just sick and tired of that. I was sick and tired of learning the line. So I couldn't even like look at it and think, I guess. Right. <laughs> That's it's all I'm like, I, I, I don't know. And so you have to have a third party come in. And like when we did our million, I was absolutely exhausted with hearing that song. Yeah. And I love, I, and you love that I song. I love that song. <laughs> but I can't, like, I, I'm telling you, I've listened to that song one, Leland, that was Leland's favorite song for ever. Uh, cause I listened to it so much too for preparation, but like, I was just, I couldn't even f see it objectively. I'm like, I don't know. I can't, I'm just, and then once it's out, you're like, okay, finally done. I don't have that's, to think about this. Anymore. That's, that's <laughs> why sometimes like I've seen this happen with Avengers questions with like Mark Rylance and other people on the panel, mm -hmm. you'll get Avenger fans that are encyclopedic in their knowledge of the Marvel universe. And the actors are like, I hope they're not asking that question because I don't know and I should because I'm that freaking character <laughs> um, because I memorized it for the movie and then we did it and then it's, it's in my brain and it's out well, and, and I'm done. Especially since a lot of times when they do those interviews, it's almost a year later. Sometimes. Right? Yeah. And then, you'll, then you get stuff like for Star Trek, 
you get people 30 years later in episode this, they know the episode number and they know the scene. I've seen Bill Shatner getting questions and he's like, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't even remember that episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, great interview. I yeah, loved it. Really good. Um, let us know what other interviews from him, other directors, and what should be the next Monty Rotnam film that we watch? Let us know down below. Just